Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question is, can I analyze the stabbing murders in Moscow, Idaho? These murders involved four college students. Just a reminder, I'm not diagnosing anybody in this video, only speculating about what could be happening in a situation like this. If you find this video to be enlightening, please like it and subscribe to my channel. Also, please consider supporting me on Patreon. I'll put the link to Patreon in the description for this video. First, I'll look at the background of this case. I'll move to the timeline of the crime, then offer my analysis. This case involves four University of Idaho students, 21-year-old Kaylee Goncalves, 21-year-old Madison Mogan, 20-year-old Ethan Chapman, and 20-year-old Zanna Kernodal. Kaylee, Madison, and Zanna lived in a rental house off campus in the college town of Moscow, Idaho. The population of Moscow is about 26,000. The town is about 80 miles south of Spokane, Washington. Ethan lived in a different residence, presumably in the same area. Kaylee and Madison knew each other since the sixth grade. Zanna and Ethan were romantically involved. The house where the three female students lived is located at 1122 King Road. It has three floors with two bedrooms on each floor. The driveway of the house is actually off of Queen Road. On the second floor, the rooms are separated by a living room and a kitchen area. The house is built on a hill, so the second floor is level with the ground on one side. Kaylee, Madison, and Zanna lived with two other young female students in that same house. Now moving to the timeline of the crime. On Saturday, November 12, 2022, Ethan and Zanna attended a party not far from the house on King Street. They were at the party from around 8 to 9 p.m. By 1.45 a.m., now on November 13, Ethan and Zanna were back at the King Street house. Kaylee and Madison were at a club on Main Street from 10 p.m. on November 12 to 1.30 a.m. on November 13. They stopped at a food truck on Main Street at about 1.40 a.m. The police said that a private party drove them from this location to their house on King Street. They arrived at about 1.45 a.m. The police initially said that it was a rideshare, but they corrected the statement later. So by 1.45 a.m., all four students were at the house on King Street. At this time, the other two female roommates were also in the house. They had returned home by 1 a.m. According to Kaylee's sister, Kaylee's phone was used to place six calls to a former boyfriend named Jack between 2.26 a.m. and 2.44 a.m. Madison then called Jack three times. Kaylee called Jack one more time at 2.52 a.m. So a total of 10 calls to Jack were made from Kaylee and Madison. Kaylee's sister said it was not unusual for Kaylee to repeatedly call people until they answered. This makes it seem as though those calls did not represent an emergency. Rather, this was typical behavior. Sometime between 3 and 4 a.m., Kaylee, Madison, Santa, and Ethan were murdered in the house. They were each stabbed multiple times. Several hours later, at 11.58 a.m., a party who has not been identified called 911 from a cell phone owned by one of the roommates so one of the two roommates who were not killed. The person reported an unconscious person at the house. When the police arrived, they found the door to the house open. There was no sign of forced entry. They found the four murder victims inside. The other two roommates were uninjured. At the time making this video, the police don't know a lot in this case, or at least they're not sharing a lot. Here's what they found during their investigation so far. The victims were likely asleep, when they were attacked. Some of the victims were murdered in their beds. There was no indication of any crime related to sex. Nothing was stolen from the house. Some of the victims had defensive wounds. The father of Zanna said that his daughter fought off her attacker to the very end. Presumably, he had some source of information to make the statement. All the victims were found on the second and third floors of the house. One of the doors of the house was secured by a key code entry system it was known by many students and others in the area. Many guests came in and out of the rental house. 
it was considered to be a party house. I imagine the house will no longer be remembered as a party house. The killer may have used that door, or they may have used a sliding glass door, which may not have been locked. The two female roommates who were in the house and uninjured are not considered suspects. A man seen by the food truck when Kaylee and Madison were there during the early morning hours of November 13 is not considered a suspect. Someone who was there at the food truck said that Kaylee and Madison did not appear to be in distress. The private party who drove Kaylee and Madison home to King Street is not considered a suspect. The murder weapon has been described by the police as a pretty large knife and a military-style knife. The weapon has not been found. The police do not have any suspects in the murders. Now moving to my analysis. It's worth noting that this case is still in the early stages. New information will almost certainly become available later. It's also worth noting that the police are withholding evidence from the public, and they may be lying as well. The police force in Moscow is clearly overwhelmed. They are not equipped for this type of investigation. The last homicide in Moscow was about seven years ago. The police there said that this was the worst crime they had ever seen. With this in mind, what could have happened in this case? This is just a theory based on the very limited information available at this point. The police said that some of the murder victims were in their beds. Based on the phone activity, it looks like Kaylee and Madison may have been awake when the murders took place. They were making calls just before 3 a.m., and the murders took place between 3 and 4 a.m. The killer was almost certainly a man. Women rarely commit murders like this. The killer was probably between 18 and 40 years old. The offender somehow made entry into the house probably through an unlocked door or by using a key code, which he somehow obtained. The man was able to kill the victims quickly enough to where they didn't scream, or they didn't scream loud enough to attract attention from the other roommates. This would have taken a great deal of physical exertion and strength. Presumably, Kaylee and Madison would have been in separate rooms, and Ethan and Zana would have been sharing one room. The killer probably went to each room looking for one specific person. I think it's safe to assume he was looking for one of the five women in the house, probably Kaylee, Madison, or Zana, considering that those three individuals were murdered. The killer may have gone through the bedroom systematically until finding who he was looking for. If he was willing to kill four people, he was probably willing to kill six. I think he kept committing murders until he found his intended target. This means that the last person he killed may have been the person who he was targeting. The police said there was no evidence of a crime related to sex, but it's very likely the motive was sexual. The killer was probably someone who had been rejected by one of the women he murdered, but he may have been watching one or more of the women from afar. The killer is probably considered to be socially awkward and a creepy loner by people who know him. He never quite fit in. He probably has a criminal record. It's likely he has a history of being possessive and controlling in romantic relationships, or he has never been in a romantic relationship. The killer was probably injured to some extent in the attack. It's difficult to commit four murders with a knife and not be injured, especially considering some of the victims had defensive wounds. The killer would also be missing some of his clothing. He probably was covered in blood and disposed of his clothing to escape the consequences of his behavior. The murderer may not have had any expectation of getting away with this crime when he entered the house. The house was occupied by six people. Presumably, all of them had cell phones. Under normal circumstances, someone would have been able to call the police. It looks like the killer simply went through the motions and exited the house. Amazingly, no one called the police. He was probably surprised at not being arrested. After committing the murders, the man was probably very excited for several hours. If anyone had seen him in the hours following the homicides, he would have looked agitated. Moving to the next section. These murders remind me of a crime that was committed in 1978 at the Chi Omega Sorority House at Florida State University in Tallahassee. On December 30, 1977, a notorious serial killer named Ted Bundy escaped from custody from a jail in Aspen, Colorado. He made his way 
to Tallahassee, Florida, and rented a room at a boarding house five blocks from the Chi Omega sorority house. Late on January 14, 1978, Ted Bundy went to a club where many sorority sisters would hang out. Several women at the club said that Ted was staring at them and made them feel uncomfortable. At 2.45 a.m., now on January 15, Ted Bundy made his way to the sorority house. He picked up a piece of firewood outside of the back door and entered the structure. There was a broken combination lock on the door. He walked into one bedroom and murdered a sorority sister. He walked across the hallway into another bedroom and committed another murder. He then entered a room occupied by two women. He attacked them both. They were severely injured but survived. Ted exited the sorority house after being scared by another sorority sister who was being dropped off by her boyfriend. He walked several blocks away and attacked another woman. She was severely injured but survived. Ted Bundy committed another murder in February of that year before being arrested. He was eventually executed. Sixteen months after the Chi Omega murders, another sorority sister would die, this time from a self-inflicted gunshot wound. She felt guilty because she was in a room next to one of the victims. She couldn't understand how she failed to hear the attack. It is believed that Ted Bundy thought he would be arrested for the Chi Omega attack. He never expected that he would get away with it. He thought that this would be his last vicious attack, he was giving in to his rage and being completely reckless. Whoever perpetrated the attack in Moscow, Idaho, may have had the same belief. Again, there may not have been any expectation of actually getting away with the crime. Just like Ted Bundy, his rage will be activated at some point in the future. It will not just go away because he committed these four murders. Now moving to my final thoughts. The students who were murdered probably felt safe right before the crime. They may have believed that consequences for committing murder would prevent someone from doing it. This is normally true, but sometimes the killer comes along who has no fear of getting caught. Even less frequently, a killer like this somehow escapes. Now the community of Moscow, Idaho will stay on edge until he is caught. If he is never arrested, their fear will persist for the foreseeable future. Those are my thoughts on the murder case in Moscow, Idaho. Please put any opinions and thoughts in the comment section. They always generate an interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found my analysis of this topic to be informative. Thanks for watching.